Welcome to the Applied Blockchain Podcast, where blockchain technology and innovation are in the spotlight. My name is Adi Benari, and I'm the founder and CEO of Applied Blockchain, and I'll be your host as we dive into relaxed conversations with industry experts and thought leaders to get their views on what they're building, the Web3 ecosystem and its transformative impact on the modern world. Paul O'Neill, welcome to the Applied Blockchain Podcast. Um, just before we get started, um, I've got another guest with me, uh, which is uh, from the Applied Blockchain team, Andy Campbell. Uh, Andy, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, head of product at Applied Blockchain. Uh, so, uh, I guess the, the reason I'm on this one is we're using uh, we're using Intel SGX, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about probably quite a lot on, uh, in the next half hour or so, uh, for for a couple of products here. So. Um, yeah, have uh, a bit of context. Uh, I, lo- I, I, lo- I look over um, two, two pieces of product for us, uh, London Bridge and Silent Data, both of which are a bit on top of Intel products. Okay, amazing. So I think this is going to be a really interesting episode. There's a lot to talk about, and people don't always think about Intel in terms of blockchain technology, but we think that there's some super interesting technology here, and that's why we focused on it, you know, especially for our product work and R&D work. Um, and somebody who I've been uh, working with on this, uh, on the Intel side, is Paul. Uh, so, Paul, please uh, introduce yourself, give us a bit of background, how you got into all of this, uh, please. Well, thanks, Adi, uh, for, for having me here today, first of all. It's great to uh, connect with you. We've known each other for a little while now, and uh, some very interesting uh, things, I think, that you guys have done with our technology. But uh, I'm Paul O'Neill. So I'm part of the what we call the Confidential Computing Group uh, at Intel, and and that group is focused on uh, technologies like Intel SGX that uh, we just talked about there. Um, my background is very much uh, pre-Intel was very much startups, right? So I kind of, you know, company the biggest company I worked for was like 150 people, and then we came in Intel. So from that perspective, trying to grow into that big company and that big corporation led me into sort of thinking and focusing more on emerging technologies uh, inside of a large corporation. The first sort of emerging technology that we sort of focused on in sort of 2016 was blockchain, right? We remember that we had uh, ledgers like Sawtooth, for example, and we had things, great uh, innovations. It was like developed by, by Intel itself, right? That was a, an Intel project. Yeah. Sawtooth was an Intel project, yeah. We had great technologies like uh, proof of elapsed time, et etc. et cetera. But the reason I say that is that that was kind of the genesis of, hey, you know, there's a privacy problem here, right? And there's a uh, technology that we have called Intel SGX, which I'll describe to your listeners now in a second. <clears throat> and we can sort of marry these technologies together to solve a, a real problem, right? And that was 2016. That's seven years ago now. And we're still chipping away at that uh, privacy problem at this stage. Uh, applied blockchain has uh, certainly taken that, tackled it and brought it to the ground in many senses using Intel technologies. But the emergence of blockchain for us at Intel uh, was a sort of aha moment in this whole sort of privacy space and this trust space, uh, you know, the concept of using technology to trust things that are going on, allowing technology to uh, give you some trust on operations that are potentially happening on other people's machines, right, where they can neither see or influence what's going on in that sense. So that kind of gave us that little jump into confidential computing, which is a sort of industry known term at this point in time. And in around 2017, maybe 2018, we started some discussions with some of the cloud providers because the cloud providers at that point were at a point where they were going, hey, you know, trust is being eroded. Uh, we've had leaks, we've had hacks, there's been data out there. You can think of the Edward Snowden leaks and, and other bits and pieces like that. So the cloud customers came to us because we have this unique uh, place in the ecosystem where we're looking up from the silicon up. And they said, hey, you know, we our customers are looking for ways to minimize trust. Uh, and when you look at what, you know all the scenarios for how data is being handled in a sort of public cloud environment and even in an on-premise environment, there's concerns around data privacy. Generally, is my data private when it's being computed on in the cloud? Um, we want to do things like get into regulation and compliance, uh, all that sort of stuff that's going on. GDPR came in, I think, in 2018, I think, right? So that uh, sort of ratcheted down the sort of regulations and compliance, and that led to things like you know, cross-border transfer, SHREMS 2, and all that type of stuff. But generally, customer trust in the environment uh, was, was eroding. 
So our technologies that we had looked at of blockchain, then all of a sudden became a solution to potentially allow for a, uh, a trust level that customers could assert into the cloud, do some operations where the cloud could neither see uh, nor influence that. Now that, that and technology... That, and that's, that's regardless of blockchain, right? That's, that's, that's like just really just looking at processing yeah. in the cloud and hosting yeah. in the cloud. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but that also became super useful for blockchain technology as well. Yes. The ubiquity of this technology within clouds where, you know, blockchain companies could come along to clouds and build blockchain networks with a privacy layer already there just using this technology. This technology we're talking about is called Intel SGX in, in its shortest term, right? Our Intel Software Guard extensions, which, to give it its full legal term, a bit of a handful. But ultimately what this is, is if you think of what Intel does, right? Everybody, Intel's the first company I've ever worked for, or my mother knows what uh, Intel do, right? It's the first <laughs> company, right? So you, you, you can actually- I, that, I can't explain to my wife what I do, and actually, yeah. Intel, like you said, to find the well, people on. Um, yeah, even even my father, right? So he, he, you know, he drives past the Intel has a. I'm based in Ireland for for anybody who's probably picked my accent up at this stage. But in Ireland, we've got like four thousand people working in a, in a fabrication and in a plant here. My father's able to drive past and go, you know, that's where my son works, even though I don't really work there. I work virtually, but uh, it's a different thing. But anyway, it's from yeah, that perspective. I, I, you know, I'm originally from Israel, and Intel was one of the first if not the first big tech company to, to actually set up shop yeah. in Israel. And, and Intel, by the way, is, is somebody told me recently, one of my Israeli friends, that they're the biggest employer in, in Israel, right? So uh, no, no, I, can, I can completely believe that. And I'd say that they're, you know, a big part of the Israeli tech scene and industry really started from that moment yeah. that Intel came in. And, and the smarts of, of, you know, that come out of Israel from our security perspective is really, really high, right? So. So we started this journey, uh, you know, um, at Intel, everybody knows kind of what we do. We build silicon chips, uh, ultimately, right? Now, we do lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of other things, right? You know, we're massive contributors, open source, and all those sort of bits and pieces. But that's what we're known as, right? But on these um, CPUs, then, we're starting to build, you know, trust layers or, you know, robust things that go on on top of that. And they could be, you know, the optimization of performance, for example. There could be lots of different things that go on. It's not just about the silicon. But when we think about, um, you know, how we can get the best use of this silicon from a security perspective, this concept of Intel Software Guard extensions or SGX became, uh, you know, part of this strategy to help, you know, blockchain companies do things in private or basically enterprises do things in private on the cloud. And what it is is a, effectively a trusted execution environment, right? And, and a trusted execution environment is really a piece of encrypted memory that sits on top of the silicon accessed by a, a fairly uh, robust SDK or some of the methods in that. And really what you can do inside of this, um, you know, uh, trusted execution environment is do things like isolation, right? You can separate, um, you know, the trusted execution environment from all the underlying software, the administrators and, and other cloud tenants, for example, right? So that means if, you know, some of the operating systems are poisoned by a some attack or whatever, they still can't access what's going on inside this uh, little trusted execution environment. Um, People describe it as like, you know, um, we're traveling around with our passport. We put it in a safe, right? Uh, you can't see the safe, you can hotel employees, etc. Uh, like a black box. I think of it and describe it sometimes as a black box inside. Exactly. It. exactly. So yeah. you can't, it's like, hey, you know, I've got uh, my favorite ring and I need to get it uh, fixed by the, uh, you know, the jeweler, but I don't trust the jeweler, uh, but I want to put it where the jeweler can't access it. So... How do I do this uh, where the jeweler can fix the ring but can't access the ring or can't touch the ring? It's kind of like that sort of uh, a magical thing. But ultimately, it's encrypted memory. The size of these trusted execution environments can go up to, you know, half a terabyte. So that means you can do pretty extensive workloads in these, you know, in the blockchain sensor, you, we need smaller ones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's all about encryption and control, right? So as we're building blockchain networks out, you know, the you know, workload owner will hold the keys to decrypt data. It will retain control, prevent access by, by cloud providers, other entities, et cetera, et cetera. So that concept of encryption is really the pervasive part of all of this, right? Keys and encryption. 
the the other part of uh, of this as well i think uh ali this is a really important uh part and a differentiator maybe uh, as we maybe talk about other privacy enhancing technologies later right the thing that we can do with uh, trusted execution environments on the silicon is that we can verify them right so it, we have a concept called attestation and so really what what happens is that when you take your workloads uh, into these trusted execution environments you can ask effectively ask Intel, hey, Intel, is this machine the one it says it is? Is this machine up to date? Has, has it got all the latest security patches? Is this algorithm approved? You know, is the hash of this algorithm the one that we've proved to access this data set? And if all of those things fail, you can say, hey, we're, we're not going to get into this, uh, this function uh, at this point in time. And that's a very powerful uh, tool uh, for blockchain owners in particular, because then you get into you know, how do you trust articles? Uh, how can you test the certain machines that want to access smart contracts, uh, et cetera? So that's a, a very important point as well. So the kind of summary of what we're doing, uh, you know, in this trusted execution environment is providing isolation, right? Uh, we're using silicon-based technology to create a hardware-enforced trusted execution environment where sensitive data is only decrypted inside of that trusted execution environment and only software inside the trusted execution environments, trust boundary can access that sense of data. And that creates that technological separation from the software and the admins outside the trust boundary, including, you know, whatever cloud management stack hypervisor, etc. The second thing is encryption and control. So with this confidential computing technology, Intel SGX, authorized data owners hold, uh, hold the keys to their data, right? So outside the trusted execution environment, the, the, the data is encrypted. And inside the trusted execution environment, only the authorized software or parties can view it. Cloud providers, et cetera, can't access or can't influence the result of any computation there as well. And then that last piece I said, attestation or verification. How do you know that the trusted execution environment is genuine and functioning properly? Uh, confidential computing technology includes cryptographic verification that the trusted execution environment is genuine, updated with policy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's ultimately the technology piece of this and if I tie that back to the original story blockchain had a privacy thing cloud had a privacy thing the two have become married where this SGX technology has become almost a go-to technology for permissioned blockchains because of its ubiquity uh, effectively yeah. so that that's kind of the journey that I came on it's a long winded way of getting to where I am <laughs> Okay, no, that's great. I just want to play play back some of that um, just a little bit, just to make sure we're kind of uh, fully understanding it. So, first of all, the the privacy problem in and and blockchain and why it surfaced in blockchain is, let's say, before blockchain, the data is sitting inside an organization, and when we talk about data privacy, we're really trusting that organization to look at the data and to really manage and restrict how it deals with that data. Right? And, and, and enforce their data policy within the organization. That, that's really what I'm trusting. Um, and and w when blockchain came along, we suddenly had these ledgers where data was being distributed into mul to multiple parties. And, and so certainly in some types of blockchain solutions environments, we needed a data privacy solution uh, alongside that. Or, 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 you know, and and that, that really drove a lot of exploration that we did as well into cryptography in general and technologies like zero knowledge proofs, which are software based cryptography solutions. But then they came with a lot of challenges. And then alongside that, we started looking at hardware based solutions like Intel SGX, which we found that actually suddenly ticked a lot of the boxes that we needed um, and allows us to get to a place very quickly. Um, so that's, that's maybe on the blockchain side. Then looking at the confidential computing, my understanding of it is that you've got the cloud providers. Obviously, we're deploying applications to them together with lots of customer and sensitive data. Um, and to prevent them maybe from having access to the data itself, a confidential computing solution would mean that the Intel hardware and, and SGX solution provides those guardrails so that actually even the cloud provider can't get to the data because it's, it's encrypted and it's in a place where the host can't access it, right? So that's in the cloud, so even non-blockchain solutions, that's how that works there. Yeah, is that all correct? Spot on, I think the, okay. I probably introduced the term confidential computing 
uh, we should probably think about what that is, right? I mean, so that's more of a macro term to describe some of the technologies that I've, um, uh, well, one of the technologies I described there. As the sort of confidential computing world evolves, um, you know, confidential computing really encompasses trusted execution environments by many different hardware vendors, right? So it's important to note that the movement of confidential computing um, is not just an Intel thing, right? It's, a, it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, AMD, uh, ARM, others, NVIDIA are also looking at uh, confidential computing and have confidential computing solutions, some good, very good confidential computing solutions, maybe different sizes, right? But not to go too deep, if I distinguish, you know, this SGX is, is something that is really, really robust from a cryptography perspective and a protection perspective, right? You can, you can, you know, reinforce or you can do application isolation down to a function in your code, as you, as you guys know, because you're, you're right down at that level. But in some cases, you know, enterprises want to use a VM. Uh, they want to encrypt an entire VM as well. So it's the swing from, you know, confidential VMs right over to application isolation. So the, the term confidential computing yeah. is a large term, mostly cloud based. But, you know, as I said, Intel is not the only one in this. And, you know, as we brought this forward, the Linux Foundation have taken on now the confidential computing consortium where all these players are part of as well. And there's a lot of blockchain companies that are uh, part of this because yeah, a lot you, you joined that as well. Actually. Yeah, you, you're in there as well, right? So as part of the uh, confidential computing consortium, because the evolution of confidential computing uh, is not just about, you know, the hardware piece of it. In order for this to really grow, we're looking at how do we get attestation protocols uh, built yeah. through this sort of thing so that attestation looks the same for everybody, right? Regardless of the of the um, underlying technology, if we think about how you know this will evolve over the next couple of years, I mean, right now, confidential computing is really forming, I would say, right? And, and you know, a lot of cloud providers are on board now, but their roadmaps are all at different stages, right? So we're building this infrastructure as a service concept, really. When you think about you know, uh, containers and, you know, what we're doing with Kubernetes and then bits and pieces like that. But ultimately what's going to happen is that these cloud providers are going to come along and build platform services on top of this infrastructure service. And that's where the monetization efforts will probably be focused. And blockchain is going to be one of the key workloads that they're going to build on top of these, um, these areas, right? So they're going to build capabilities for mm. the likes of applied blockchain to just simply plug into these, these layers, uh, confidential ledgers and stuff like that, which as you know, Eddie, Microsoft have already done at this point uh, as well. So the evolution of how this technology becomes part of a core network and platform services is really going to be the most interesting journey, I think, over the next couple of years. Um, but that's not next year. It's probably two to three years out, I think, at this point. Can I, can I ask Paul, so, so we, we've spoken a lot about like the chip and the cloud providers, but what, what about like the, the kind of core use cases from like an application uh, perspective? So what, what is it that you've seen kind of uh, people that are building on top of what the cloud providers are providing? What, what use cases are they, are they kind of hitting or what, what do you think are some of the more interesting use cases that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, so the use cases are varied, but, the, you know, it, it really it really comes down to um, a couple of different areas, right? You, you could talk about different buzzwords and stuff like that, but if we, if we compress it, um, there's a lot of work around simple things like cloud migration, right? So this is a, a really key area, right? So a lot of highly regulated companies, um, you know, they just simply can't get into cloud economics because some of the data sets that they're using are just too sensitive, right? Are their GDPR infected or uh, PII infected or whatever from that perspective? So, you know, things that involve personal data, people are reticent to bring to the cloud. The, the, the regulations in Europe are pretty strict now, right? Around uh, what you can and can't do, right? Uh, privacy by design, you know, people, a lot of people using techniques like, um, pseudonymization, but when you get into pseudonymization, then you're getting into data that's not the native data. And then the, the key use cases like collaborative analytics or AI and machine learning tend to die a little bit from, from that perspective. But I, I would say, you know, uh, getting that cloud migration is sort of the, the first area. And, you know, we, we see lots of really interesting things. Like there's a big company in, in Europe that's just migrated an entire stack 
uh, to the cloud to do streaming TV, for example. So the streaming TV has all DRM built into it with, uh, the, with SGX holding keys, but also is protecting subscriber data. So it's um, multiple pieces like that. We also have, we also see <coughs> great um, innovations with AI and machine learning. So for example, um, you know, we've done a lot of work uh, publicly with Bosch, for example, in this case, where, you know, Bosch is, is you know, looking at uh, ADAS or uh, autonomous driving uh, algorithms, right? In order to train those algorithms, they have to take, you know, street views, people's faces, uh, et cetera, et cetera, car number plates, registrations, all those sort of, again, PII infected stuff. And when they're running their algorithms on that, right, so they, they have a choice, right? They can obfuscate or blur the faces and, and take those things out. But they do that, they're diluting the value of the, the data itself, right? Imagine, you know, the algorithm sees a plastic bag and thinks that's a blurred face, stops a car in the middle of the street and stuff like that. So they want to use the real data, but they've got the whole concerns around GDPR and, and all that sort of stuff, right? The other piece of this is that in their case, you know, they uh, they can buy a whole load of hardware and do this, and that's expensive. It becomes a capex cost, right? But by bringing it to the cloud, they can stop start project base. It's an opex cost, right? From that perspective, but the GDPR barrier is there, right? So what they do is that they encrypt all that, and they run all of that training inside of SGX Enclave, so the data is always protected. And then you're getting into privacy by design, which you know, GDPR likes and stuff like that as well. And then you're getting into protection against cross-border uh, transfers and bits and pieces like that. So it became A, a very economical project and B, a great example of how you build a confidential neural network uh, running on, in this case, uh, was Microsoft Azure in, in this case as well. So they're, they're kind of a good sense of the use cases. Um, I think that, that collide down. Uh, privacy preserving ad tech in this cookie-less world that we're moving into. You know, people want access to first party data. That data is encrypted. They want to get that for targeted ads. And privacy preserving blockchains is still, you know, a big area. In fact, I, I would think that in the last, in the last year or so, uh, that's significantly on the rise. Uh, I think as, as networks pop up, uh, I think SGX is, you know, a good choice there, I think. And other technologies that will come out around confidential VMs may make it a little easier as well as, uh, to do that. Yeah. There are other privacy enhancing technologies, obviously, as well, you know, with homomorphic encryption and secure multi-party computation out there uh, that are robust technologies, you know, based on mathematical trust. They're maturing, I think, but I think it will take some time for them to mature to a point where they scale, uh, etc. But there are some excellent companies like Zama, for example, who are working in the in the blockchain space as well. So it's not all about trusted execution environments. There are many technologies. Well, not many. There are you know some good technologies coming, and I believe at some point in time, it'll be potentially a combination of all that will solve this macro privacy problem that we have. I mean, this is a real issue that we have to solve. You know, blockchain is a, is a, is a part of it. But from a cloud perspective, um, this is a real issue that we have to solve. Paul, I just, I, I just want to sort of, again, summarize a little bit and come back to the tech a little bit as well. So if, if I categorize these, then there's, there's cloud computing in general, right, which is the cloud providers allowing you to host something where, where, where their access to the data is no longer available. The, and, and, and I guess primary use cases for that also include AI, yep. which you alluded to. Yep. And together with that, the, and, and also AI being part of that, is, is shared data, right? So it's so data that comes from multiple organizations, which they wouldn't normally be allowed to share, or they, 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 they maybe could only use together in an environment where none of them can actually access the data directly. Um, and again, that probably comes back to AI as well. If you've got a shared pool of data, which has restrictions around it, then you can probably do some more interesting AI analytics and so on on it without right. Infringing right. privacy constraints. All of that kind of falls into the, let's say, the non-blockchain cloud uh, use cases. But also an important point, I, I, I think, again, from my understanding, is it's not enough just to say, here's a cloud application, I'm going to run it in SGX. A key thing here is the interface, right? Because if I say it's running on SGX, but actually it's fairly open in who can go in and go out or who can actually get to the data, the fact that it's running in a confidential computing environment on its own probably isn't enough, right? It, it has to be, the interface has to be tight to the point where 
the parties can only do, or specific parties can only access the data in a, in a, in a certain way, to, you know, and, and, and those restrictions are there, right? So there's a there's a hardware and, and sort of standard component to it, but there's also a soft la a, a layer around that, a wrap around that, that has to be done correctly, otherwise the privacy could be compromised. Correct. Yep. Okay. So that's so, so that's that part. And then the other thing I wanted to go back to was the attestation. Just, that, just, that, with the attestation just, just so the viewers understand. So with, with the technologies, viewers and listeners, I guess, with the, the technology, you know, we there's an SDK, right, to, to this. And yeah. as we're looking at, I describe confidential VMs and I describe application isolation. There's a trade-off, right? If you want to get down to application isolation where you're securing down to a function, you know, there's work to do, right? This is yeah. not... Uh, that's what uh, really, is, Yeah, yeah. It's not just like, yeah, that's why you have smart people. It's not there. just throw it in a box. It's yeah. how, how yeah. can that box be at, you know, where, where's the hole for something to get in or out, right? Because there yeah. still needs yeah. to be some. Yeah, access. but as you as you turn it up the other way where you might want to do less work, but your security, your threat model is a little less and your posture has to be a little less than, you know, let's encrypt the VM. But in your world here, you've got uh, cryptographic experts uh, who can use the SDK that comes with SGX and secure that down to a function right from that level. And that that's the type of work, for example, if you look at, um, you know, the German healthcare's movement towards you know, single digital platforms, right, uh, for health, life insurance and all that sort of uh, health insurance, that's all done with Intel SGX at an SDK level, right, really ratchet it down from that perspective. Yeah. So, so that's just to clear that up. That's you know for everybody. Now you were going to talk about attestation. Yeah. Okay. So for the attestation, again, my, my understanding of it is, we've got this black box. We can encrypt some data and send it in, so the host can't see the data. Inside there, there's going to be some computation, and then the data is going to come out, and somebody's going to receive the output. Now, when I receive the output, if I'm a user, because I can't see what's going on inside, I, I need some guarantees about what's happened to my data that it's actually been computed in this environment, that the privacy has been maintained, and maybe that specific activity has been carried out on it, and not other activity, right, which might involve sharing it, for example. So really to provide those guarantees, we have this mechanism around SGX where we can have the source code or the code that runs inside SGX um, effectively signed by Intel, and that signature also signed, well, it's a, I think it's a hash of the code, and Intel is also signing the, 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 let's say, uh, the fact that this is an Intel chip and this is an environment that's running, you know, this version of, uh, of, of the uh, Intel SDK, maybe some, I don't, I don't remember all the details, but it's effectively a wrapper that says this is what's running in the enclave. Intel doesn't actually see the code itself, I don't think, but Intel can assign and attest to the fact yeah. that we, this is... Yeah, I do, yeah. so we don't, obviously we don't see, yeah, we, we can't see or influence what's going on inside that box either, right? So there's... Exactly. Uh, that we can do there but what we can do is if in a consortium level you know take two big farmers right two big farmers want to combine on a clinical trial you know they'll approve an algorithm to do that that algorithm will take a hash and then using attestation you can make sure that that's the right hash so if that's the hash everybody's agreed on that's fine but what goes on inside that box nobody can see right so to be clear about that, there are no back doors or any of this sort of stuff. This is the question I get asked all the time. Like, can Intel see what's going on in that box? No, right? So we, we can't do that. But to be clear, you know, you're not going to open that black box until all of the rules have been, uh, you know, approved. So you're going to tick the fact that, hey, it's a genuine CPU. You're going to tick the fact that the CPU is up to date security patches because if it didn't, then you're vulnerable. And then you're going to tick the box that, hey, this algorithm is the one. And once those operations, or once those things are approved, then begin your operation. And not yeah. until no, I'm not going to open the box, I'm going to send data in, in, and I'm going to trust what comes out. Yeah. Right? Exactly. But that's the whole point, right? Once you once you trust in, you can trust out, right? Yeah, I, I think, it, like, I just want to come back to something you, you touched on a minute ago. Um, so, yeah, like, you, you spoke about homomorphic encryption and, and MPC. We, we, we did um, a bit of an exploration, I think it was around 2019, 2018, with, with those different technologies. I think it's, it's worth saying for, because so far we've had a lot of conversation, I guess, at the technical level. I think like for, for people not of the technical level listening to this, I think the thing that is kind of interesting with, or like some of the pro 
one of the properties that I think makes Intel SGX very interesting versus other technologies is when we talk about MPC, uh, yeah, homomorphic encryption, also uh, things like permission blockchains that have some kind of privacy layer. A, a lot of the time when, when we talk about, okay, how can we actually get value from this um, and uh, in like say a, a network of competitors, what it often means is is setting up the network first, or there's there's like a, a large overhead, let's say, to, to setting up something like that. Even with you know something like MPC, it's like okay, so you know we've got this um, let's say kind of public good or industry good use case. So let's um, let's build that um, from starting from one of those organizations. That organization who wants to build that use case has to kind of get the organ other organizations on board, set up some kind of consortium. Yeah. You know, lo, uh, like, and, and do an MPC. I think we'll, we'll, we'll do some kind of MPC, permission blockchain, whatever it is, with some privacy layer, whatever it is. I think one of the things that's kind of um, that's, that's very interesting, I think, from an enterprise point of view, from S, uh, SGX, is that you, you kind of get the you get the economics of a SaaS model, right? You kind of you kind of say, okay, you know, this thing can run in one place. We can have one one organization maybe in, invest in the same everywhere, right? Yeah, and, and and then they can go and, and say, hey, look, like you can you can trust this thing. You don't have to trust us. You can trust because we can't thing. we can't get to the we data, to the and data. we can't influence what's yeah. happening to the data yeah. either. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 but that, that that is the good thing about using. Sorry, one of the good things about using a hardware based level, it, it looks the same, smells the same uh, everywhere, right? So if you write an application for one, then it generally moves across with uh, SMPC or homomorphic encryption. You, you find that. Most projects become bespoke projects, but as I say, there are good companies out there like Zama and others that are looking at this uh, from a, a perspective. And I think over time, you know, a collision of all of these, uh, I think, will come. The, the other thing that we see, we're seeing a bit of as well, guys, as well, is that uh, the, the whole concept of a private ledger, where the whole blockchain contains encrypted uh, transactions, right? Uh, you know, where hardware protection for code and data is in that uh, in that mode as well. Where validation nodes, you know, share the keys, decrypt transactions internally, etc. You know, this type of uh, blockchain we're seeing in in some financial services sort of uh, arenas as well. That an entire encrypted blockchain from that perspective. And when you get into that, then you're really getting into uh, you need performance, right? So, in all of this, because I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of your listeners that are listening here go, these guys got on with this great technology, but what's the overhead, right? I mean, surely I'm going to get penalized for using this encryption technology and stuff like that. The overhead from a hardware perspective is, is not that high, right? It depends, obviously, on, on how you uh, write your code and, and bits and pieces like that. But we work really, really hard on performance, right? Really hard performance, because in the, in the space that we're in, especially around the data centers, it's a hugely competitive space these days. It's not something that Intel you know, uh, takes lightly, right, the competition there. So running encryption uh, is sometimes going to have a massive overhead, but we're chipping away at this quite a lot. And a lot of blockchain cases, you're talking about single-digit overhead uh, to use a lot of this encryption thing. Mm -hmm. And overhead leads to economics, and economics leads to people making choices about what it is they want to do and stuff like that. And we do see projects that are stalled because of economics at this point. So this whole optimization and performance area around you know making blockchains run faster with with uh, encrypted data is something that's high in our agenda uh, to, to keep pushing forward here in time. amazing andy do you want to say something about our products maybe and what we've done with yeah yeah so i i mean i i guess the the, the way the way that we've used sgx is, is very much on the kind of the, the level of um not the VM virtualization. We've, we've, we've focused a lot more on the on kind of the SDK kind of level, where the, the like the trust assumptions we're doing uh, tend to be tend to be very tight because we're in so the, the application space. yeah level. I think the application really, level, right? right? Yeah. Designing for specific use mm -hmm. cases. There's, there's a couple of things we've built on top of um, on top of SDK. So uh, one is one is a bridge, um, a secure bridge between Algorand and uh, and Ethereum. Uh, the, the, the thing that we're doing there is one, we're generating the keys inside the SGX, um, but two, and this is the, the key, the key property that the, uh, the SGX gives over, say, like a KSM, right? A key, key management, uh, sorry, KMS, a uh, key, key management service that where, um, you can, okay, you can generate your key there and, and it, and you can not reveal the key and you can kind of say, hey, sign this payload for me and you get a signed payload back. The, the, the key thing with, uh, I think key, uh, key, um, key management systems, they have their place. 
Um, but essentially, because if I can instruct the key management service to do essentially what I want to do, it, I kind of indirectly kind of have access to the key or at least have the access to the key uh, of what the key can do. So the, the way that we've, we've used um, Intel SGX for, for our bridge is essentially uh, we have uh, a light client we built inside Intel SGX for Ethereum, and we have a uh, uh, what's called like a state proof validator, which is something a, a bit specific uh, with uh, with Outbrand, where we're validating state proofs, essentially like a light client for state proofs running inside Intel SGX for Algorand. What this, is able, what, what this means we're able to do is we're able to validate both chains. So we're able to validate within an, uh, Intel SGX Oh, this is the Ethereum chain, and okay, now I've got another block. This is another block in the yeah. in the sequence. It's valid. Yeah. And, and I guess the important thing is that as a, as an operator, because yeah. a, a lot of these bridges have been hacked. Yeah. Right? As an yeah. operator, in this case, we don't have access to the keys. We don't have access to the data. We can't interfere with the process. And yeah. somebody who gets onto our servers can't do that either. Yeah. That's, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, that's a key. That's the key property we're looking for, right? It, it, is that essentially like reducing trust in the operator, right? Or, or even, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you can even argue almost eliminating trust, right? At least from like a, this actually happened over here, so therefore yeah. something's happening over that perspective on the on the uh, destination chain. Um, and yeah. then silent data? I mean, silent data. So yeah, you, men you mentioned oracles in the very beginning of the conversation. So actually what we're, what we're building at the moment, um, and we're, we're, we're currently, uh, we're currently kind of in, in, in a, a bit of a, bit of a expansion with, uh, with our silent data products. So the, the way that we're, the way that we're looking at this is that we can use Intel SGX to do attestations on, on private data. So an oracle like service on private data. So we think oracles as they as they stand, they, they work fairly well on public data, things like you know, crypto pricing, TVL, yeah. all of yeah. these things. You can you can kind of just have a validator network and say, hey, here's here's what's happened off chain, I'm gonna publish that to a smart contract. And someone can actually look at that, right? Like they can validate at least that the Oracle has told the truth up to that point, and they can they can call multiple Oracle providers to try and try and validate that. The, the, the space where where we don't think oracles are working today very well is is in private data, right? I, that that we think there's a big opportunity in private data, things like invoice systems, insurance, anything where there's some kind of authentication layer in front of the credit of credit the checks for credit off checks. for off chain yeah. either individuals or companies or background checks. Yeah, KYC, AML, all yeah. of these different things, feeding that into the into the blockchain but what we don't want to do with private data obviously is and, and we're talking public chains here we don't want to feed the actual data onto the blockchain because you can't feed, feed kyc data onto the blockchain yeah. instead what we want is the attestation that this user has been through a kyc yeah. process yeah. And, and, yeah. and we also don't want to share that data with a with a group of nodes of node validators right it's pri it could exactly. be private personal commercially sensitive so we don't want oracle operators to see this data either yeah i mean so 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 i mean that i mean i think you're describing the perfect uh, almost the perfect use case, right, for blockchain and confidential computing. I mean, if we expand that out, so to, you know, I think of a specific use case, um, you know, you've mentioned a few there, but if we've expanded a little bit, think about things like um, false insurance claims, just the one that pops into my head, right? So how do you match fraud across insurance companies? And that's a massive issue, right? Um, you know, how do we get into incentivized data collaboration? But taking all of that data, pulling it together, but still there's a privacy effort here. You've got to match private data off the chain using confidential computing to identify potential fraud and then bring it back. So the separation of, you know, that privacy piece is, is really, really critical. And that's the, the sort of piece that we're solving. Without a confidential computing or privacy enhancing technology part there, that becomes insurmountable, uh, especially given the, you know, the privacy laws that we've introduced, especially here in Europe. And that's the challenge, right? And there's a, there's a lot of business cases there that if we can put that data to work in a private way, there's incentive and reward to do that, right? So break these silos down using confidential computing, um, you know, uh, you know, for incentivized collaboration. And that's ultimately what the blockchain business is all about, right? How do we drive incentivized collaboration? And remove the barriers to privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And that's what we're 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 trying to do together, right? Yeah, that that exactly that. So so what we found that we could do with SGX that we couldn't do with the other with let's say the software encryption technologies was actually plug the Oracle into existing APIs without requiring those APIs to be modified. So in an in a, in a software encryption solution, 
whoever's exposing those APIs would have to do some other form of encryption or, or some clever stuff or have some SDK on their side. So we'd have to get the provider of the data to change in order for the data to remain yeah. private. Yeah. Whereas with silent data, we've been able to do that with existing APIs without asking them to, to modify them and still be able to provide a, a privacy-preserving Oracle service using their, yeah. from that uh, data. Asking, asking people to change what they do uh, and they're changing their internal processes, you know, the, it's a revolving door, right? You're straight up. Exactly. In, in, especially in the enterprise world. And, and so that's why we picked also as our first use case one of the hardest places to change, which is banks. And so we did. We, so we integrated with open banking, um, obviously very sensitive uh, financial data, and institutions which are not going to change their systems overnight. Uh, certainly not for uh, to, to, you know to, to service small companies. Yeah. Um, and so we we're, so were able to demonstrate that there. Uh, and um, Intel published a paper, uh, and obviously we worked together on that, showing how silent data used Intel SGX to do that, and how it can be applied to other industries as well. So that's great. We'll share the we'll, we'll share the link for that. Sure, link. Link. Yeah, yeah. And there's also really good stuff around energy trading. I think that we did also as well. Ali, is worth sharing that link. I think as part of this this too, right? But yeah. you know, I think uh, from a you know certainly from an Intel perspective, I mean, our view, our investment in this area is strong. You're going to see an awful lot come from Intel over the next few years and others in the confidential computing space. The Intel Xeon. Uh, here's where I do my shameless plug, right? The Intel <laughs> Xeon scalable lines are, are really coming fast, right? And then this technology is going to be hero featured, I think, in a lot of what's coming up. Uh, we've just uh, released fourth gen. Uh, it's the first version of, of what we call TDX, which is that confidential VM piece that we talked about, right? Which is going to build those infrastructure layers for clouds. Um, but, you know, these processes are an ideal foundation for building blockchain solutions. There's, there's no doubt about that. They include a broad set of hardware-based security features, one of which we've uh, talked a lot about here, uh, which are super valuable for companies like Applied Blockchain and others that optimize the performance of cryptographic hashing and improve blockchain security generally, right? We've got um, uh, new instruction sets. We've got uh, AVX and, and other bits and pieces in there. Uh, and those scalable processors for blockchain are, are really there to provide hardware proof of trust, protect confident, confidential information, and bring that security element without compromising performance, I think. And I think that's the match uh, that works well for blockchains uh, right now with uh, some of this technology that we're bringing out over the few, next few years. Yeah. So I think the future is bright in the confidential computing space with Intel. You should stay connected with us, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> no, we fully intend to. I mean, our, our view is that blockchain is still really early, uh, both in terms of the technology and the use cases and, 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 and how it's being rolled out and so on. And I think the same is true for the technology. Uh, confidential computing, I think it's only just beginning to be understood and tested and, and, and expanded upon. And I think there's still a very long way to go. Uh, yep. But the potential and when people will understand the privacy levels that are possible to the, even today, uh, with this type of technology, they, you know, they, they they'll start demanding it more. Yeah, um, I agree. And I think the the, the inevitability with sec with security and you know blockchain is is also about trust. Is unfortunately where there are security vulnerabilities, things just tend to go wrong over time, right? P -p people do exploit these vulnerabilities, and so you know we think that the technology is there to tighten things up. On the trust level with blockchain, or on the privacy level with technologies like SGX. That's it. There's only going to be more of that over time. Yeah. And I think, you know, I started this intro by describing how I ended up, I started in blockchain and moved to confidential computing, but that was 2016. I am only starting really to see real blockchain use cases now, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think emerging now. So I think you're, you know, what you say about uh, this is still emerging, it is, but uh, I'm starting to see some really, really interesting things by pretty big companies too. So um, uh, I think the, it's a very much a space to watch yeah. beyond cryptocurrency. Yeah, Paul, I think this, this has been super interesting for me, at least. I hope for other people. Um, uh, thank you for that, and and I think it would be great to catch up. You know, I don't know. You know, we've known each other for a year or two, maybe a year or two down the line. Given the the, the changes that happen in in this space, in these spaces, I think it would be great to catch up again and kind of see where things are relative to to this conversation at some point in the future. Um, in each in the podcast that we do, I normally ask guests at the end to give us some kind of recommendation for 
I don't know, a book, a podcast, a, a speaker, somebody that you've seen or something that you've come across there that's, that's inspired you? Have you got any anything you'd like to share? I saw a great band on Wednesday night in Dublin called The Beths, a New Zealand band, which I, I thought <laughs> uh, blew me away. They were unbelievable. Um, I'm a big sports fan, uh, like soccer fan. I listen to a lot of uh, sports uh, podcasts. I'm a big Liverpool fan, so anything to do with Liverpool podcasts, uh, if you if you want to get through that pain. But I, my, actually, my wife sent me a podcast recently that I, I hadn't heard of called The Teacher's Trial. Um it's uh, it's about an Australian long running court case, uh, or you know about a guy who apparently allegedly murdered his wife back in the eighties. But uh, I just found it the most compelling listening over like twenty episodes. Uh, you know, I'd go walk my dog with this on, and the dog would tap me on the leg at some point, and say, "Can we please go home? I'm knackered now. I don't want to walk anymore." Right? Well, then, so uh, so that that uh, that podcast was was quite good. Um, oh, so. amazing! I, mean, I, I love those kind of podcasts. I'm going to check this one out. And I also just yeah. know when I'm walking the dog. A new one for me, right? The teacher's trial, but uh, I won't give any spoilers. Uh, but it was big in the news in Australia recently. But it, ultimately, it was a guy who would have got away with it outside of this world. Uh, that's it's any more. That's any more. We're going to listen to it. Yeah. Uh, but usually when I when I get home, if I, if it's, if the if the dog's been on a really long walk, my wife will say, "What are you, what are you listening to?" And if it's taking yeah. a long time, then yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't. I love, I'm a great reader as well. I like to read books. I don't like audio books and stuff like that. But I do a lot of long distance cycling, and uh, I've started to think about should I start to listen to audio books uh, when I'm on the bike and stuff. Like that. But the teacher's trial was really really good. So I think a lot of your listeners will get a lot out of that. Well, maybe, maybe I'm just too late. Maybe I'm just too late. But everybody's heard it already. Maybe that's uh, that's also something as well. No, you never know. Okay, g- good. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. Thanks again for your time. It's Thanks. really appreciated. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Look, I look forward to that beer you only had at this point. It must be well overdue at this point. <laughs> Great. Okay. 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 Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to the Applied Blockchain Podcast. Make sure you follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter for more updates. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, please let us know by leaving a review and clicking subscribe. Until next time.